Christ is risen. Amen. Thank you for those of you liturgical folk out there. It wasn't printed in the bulletin, but you got it. I appreciate it. Uh, I first want to say thank you uh, to many of you that have offered your condolences, your, your prayers, and your support for me and my family during this time. It is, uh, your, it, it's your prayers that have carried us through, and I just wanted to publicly thank you for that. I also wanted to take a moment to once again welcome our guests uh, those of you that uh, we haven't seen in a while and those of you that maybe got uh, turned into the parking lot on accident and couldn't get out and just came on in, <laughs> welcome. We're glad you're here. We're ho we hope that you are, uh, uh, we, we hope that you experience the power of Christ today and know that this is a place where you can know, love, and serve him with others. Uh, that is our hope. You know, here we know that we can do more together. Uh, each one of us is important. And if I have to move over here, I want to see y'all's face sometimes too. So uh, it, it, we, we gather together here and we know that together we can do more. We accomplish more together. Each one of us is created independently, but to work together as a team, uh, to work together as a body, as a family. And so uh, as we start this next series next week, we're going to be talking about how we are created for significance, that each one of us is created with a purpose. And we'll start that series next week uh, as one body gathered together uh, in the CLC, uh, in the Common Ground service typically, but we will be celebrating our confirmation. Uh, class of 2019. We have uh, our, our confirmands will be, some will be baptized, some will be baptized and confirmed, and these students are making a public declaration that they are going to follow Christ. And, and I want to invite you to come back if you're a guest, if you're a member, I expect you to be there, and we are going to gather together and honor and celebrate these confirmands as they make this public declaration of their faith. And as we begin this series talking about how we are created with a purpose, that we are significant, each and every one of us. But today, it's all about the empty tomb. Today it's about the resurrection of our Lord, and I want to invite you, uh, if you didn't bring a Bible, you can grab the Pew Bible in front of you. We're going to read from Matthew 28, but I could have taken from any of the four Gospels uh, and, and read from the last chapter of any of them. But in your Pew Bibles, uh, if you turn to the New Testament section, so the back third and page 32 in there, uh, we're going to read from chapter 28 of Matthew. In just the first 10 verses, then I'll reference a little more from Matthew. I'll reference some from John. I might even hint at some from Luke or Mark before the end of our time together. But we start with Matthew 28, beginning in verse 1. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you were looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised. And he said, come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead. And indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly and with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. So let's pray. Holy God, thank you for your holy word and for this story of the resurrection of Christ. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight as we seek to understand more of this story today. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, it all started about midweek of the Passover. Some people argue it was Wednesday. Some people argue it was Thursday. I'm not going to get into that argument. Some of you in here are from both sides of that camp. It depends on if you read John or Matthew or Luke, you know, as to how you time it out. But midweek of the week of Passover, uh, Jerusalem has swelled to over a couple of million. 
Usually about 200,000, but now there's a couple of million people there. And Jesus' followers have been strong. They, they've been, they, they, they know this is the time of triumph until the arrest. And then they begin to scatter. Some of them run and hide. Some of them kind of watch from a distance. It's only a few. Jesus' mother, Mary, Mary Magdalene, a few of the other women, and John, that stayed by his side, walking the Via Della Rosa with him, walking to Golgotha with him, seeing him crucified, being there as he breathed his last breath and his body's taken down. From there, the body is, is taken to the tomb of a wealthy man named Joseph. We think he came from Arimathea. He was a Pharisee, but a follower of Jesus. And he gave his tomb for the Lord to be buried in. They didn't have time for the purity rituals because at 6 p.m. would start the Sabbath. So they would have to embalm, if you want to call it that, his body later. They would have to cover his body with the spices and herbs that was typical of the ritual of burial for them. And we don't know really a lot about what happened after that for a few hours uh, and a couple of days. Uh, we know that all but Judas of the eleven eventually came back to the upper room. We know that some of the women gathered with them. We know that some of the other followers gathered with them. And they're all gathered in the small upper room, scared to death. Here they are. They're where they had just eaten with him days before. But now they're worried that the Romans or the Jews are going to come arrest them too. And I can only imagine what was going through their minds. This man they had followed was gone. This man they believed was their Messiah, the chosen one. The one that would, would save them is now dead. Here they sat in this room where they had gathered with him and ate days before. They're bewildered, confused, and terrified. There's no way he could drive the Romans out now. They killed him. There's no way he could be their savior. He's dead. Everything they had believed seemed to be a lie. They were, they were willing to follow him to, his, to their own death. They just didn't know it would be his death. That they would be the ones left behind. You know, we know what it's like. We all know what it's like to lose a loved one. We've lost parents and grandparents. Some of us have lost children. We know what it's like. We know that heartaching grief. We know what it means to wake up each day wondering if it's going to become normal again. We know what they were going through. They had lost a loved one. They were grieving. And they were scared. What they couldn't understand is that Jesus' death on the cross was not the end of the plan. It was only the beginning of Jesus' plan. So you can imagine the shock when Mary comes running back in and saying, up from the grave he arose, saying he's alive. You know, th There were other stories. There were other miracle workers. There were, there were other legends. These ladies had woke early. And gone to the tomb with the, the spices. If you read the other Gospels, you know that they were going there to, to, to perform these burial rituals. And, and they left early while it was still dark. And they were trying to figure out how they would roll the tomb, roll the stone away to open the tomb. And, and how they would be able to get in with the guards guarding the body. But now they show up and the, the tomb is open. And the body is gone. And an angel is speaking to them. And then they run into Jesus as they're going back to tell the disciples. You know, John had been there when they laid Jesus' body in the tomb. He's the only one of the disciples that was there with Jesus for the entire time. He watched Jesus take his last breath. He helped lower him from the cross. He helped carry Jesus down the hill. 
to the tomb and lay him there. He knew Jesus was dead. John's gospel tells us that he and Peter ran to the tomb only to find it just as Mary had said. It was empty. You know, John tells us that they stepped into the tomb and they saw and they believed. But I wonder what it is that they believed at that point. Because, you know, resurrection was too big a step for them to believe at that point. I think at that point they simply believed what Mary said. The tomb's empty. His body's not here. It wasn't until they saw with their own eyes. It's not until they touched him. It's not until they witnessed the resurrection that it became real for them. That's when everything changed. You know, Matthew tells us they went straight to Galilee to see Jesus while the guards reported to the Roman and the Jewish officials uh, that Jesus had been stolen. But when the disciples saw Jesus, some worshipped him, but some doubted, even seeing. You know, we, we know this story well. We hear it every year. For those of you that, that come to, to church just on Easter, this is the only sermon you hear. Uh, we know the story. It's like the other legends of the Greek and Roman era of gods who have been raised from the dead. It seems like it's just another legend, just another story. The, the disciples probably thought the ladies were crazy when they came telling them that Jesus was alive. But then when they touched his wounds, they saw him with their own eyes. But ever since that time, people have been trying to discredit the resurrection, to say that it didn't happen. And some of you in here, I know you came with family and, and you came to honor your family, but you don't believe it happened. And I understand that. It's okay. But let's consider a few things. First of all, no rational person believes there was no Jesus. The fact that Jesus, this person who lived at the end of the era of the Jewish temple that was destroyed in 70 AD, uh, th there is... No doubt that there was this man that lived in Jerusalem, Judea. He traveled around teaching and, and was killed at the hands of the Romans. Uh, we have extra biblical literature that proves that. There's authors, uh, you know, the Jewish author and historian Josephus, the, the Roman uh, officer Tacitus or Tacitus. Uh, they both wrote about Jesus and Jesus' followers. And, and the practices of what developed as a church all the way up into the 100 ADs. So for the 70 years after the resurrection. So, so there is evidence that Jesus lived. There's evidence that Jesus was crucified by the Romans. So the only question is what happened to the body? Because there was no body there. And uh, so as you look at that, there's a couple of different things, a couple of different ways people have explained that the body was gone. The first one is, is the most ridiculous. The Romans and Jews stole the body so, they, so no one could say there was a resurrection. Now think about that one for a minute. They would have done anything to stop the rise of this movement. And if they had the body, they would have showed the body to the world so people would quit believing that he rose from the dead. So to think that they stole him so that people wouldn't believe is ridiculous. So that, that theory's out. Uh, another one, another argument is that the disciples stole the body and created this huge plan to say that he, was, he rose from the dead and, and he ascended into heaven. Uh, now, let's think about this one. This isn't Ocean's Eleven. This isn't George Clunky and Matt Demon and, and, and Brad Pitiful. They weren't the disciples, you know. These were 11 ordinary men, fishermen, a banker, you know, farmers, just normal guys. They didn't have the military prowess to pull off a stunt like this. I mean, think about it. These 11 ordinary guys were going to have to sneak up to and take out two Roman soldiers, the best trained military of the time. It would be like me picking 11 of you and us going against two special forces guys. You know, 
let's, let's take on some seals, right? I, I, I don't think I want to be a part of that, that little mission. They didn't have the skill to pull that off. Not only that, keep in mind, they would have had to have done something with the, not only Jesus' body that no one found for 2,000 years, they'd have had to do something with the Romans' bodies, the Roman soldiers' bodies. Otherwise, history would have said they had been killed and, and the body stolen. Now, here's another thing to keep in mind. These disciples took the story to their grave. Ten of these men were, cruci were crucified, beheaded, died on a stake, speared through. They were tortured, they were killed, they were burned at the stake. They were all of these horrible forms of death and torture. And yet not a single one of them fessed up to this great hoax they had created. Every single one of the men, including John, the only one to die a natural death, believed and taught the resurrection until their dying breath. They would not die for a lie. Let me ask you this. How many of you remember April the giraffe? You have to think back a couple of years. April the giraffe was a, uh, it, it was this viral sensation, if you want to call it that. Uh, it began in February of 2017. News agencies started reporting about this giraffe in a zoo in upstate New York who was going to have a baby. And her name was April, and uh, this was going to be the fourth baby. I don't know why it was such a big deal. But people would watch. They would tune in on the, the video camera to watch and see what was happening with this giraffe. News agencies would say, this is going to be the day. You know, and, and they would report on it morning, noon, and night. Well, at one point, I decided April the giraffe was not pregnant. I thought she was kind of like the stray cat that wandered up to our house when we lived in Mansfield. We, we took her in. We cared for her. We named her Carmel. We, we kept, it was winter, so we, we didn't want this pregnant cat wandering around outside in the winter. Didn't want her to have her babies, you know, in some bush somewhere with snow on the ground. So we took her into our garage. We fed her. We cared for her. We loved her. She still hasn't had kittens. <laughs> she was just fat. But heaven forbid you say a female who could be pregnant is fat. You just can't do that. You can't get away with that. Well, I finally decided that April wasn't pregnant. She was just fat. And every night I'd see on the news agency, today's going to be the day. Let's watch the videos and make sure. And I would think, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. Then April 15th, 2017, the Saturday before Easter, April had her baby. And truth is, I really don't care if a giraffe had a baby. In fact... She had another baby last month. Nobody in the world cared, no videos, no nothing. She had another baby last month. But here's my point. I could have believed April was fat. I could still believe April was just a fat giraffe. I could testify that I've seen photos of a fat giraffe. But that doesn't change the fact that on April 15th, 2017, she gave birth. You see, I can deny the resurrection. We can deny that Jesus lived. We can deny that Jesus was crucified, but the facts don't support it. The facts support that Jesus lived, died, and rose again. Here's another fact. Jesus changes lives. He changed lives then. He changes lives today. Think about Peter. This hot-headed fisherman, uneducated, became the leader of the largest movement in history. A movement that you and I are sitting in here because of. Jesus changed Peter that day. Let me ask you this. How many of you have been changed by Christ? How many of you have let Christ into your life and it's changed you from the inside out? 
God is still at work in us today. There is an unexplainable power in Jesus, not power to make us do and be what we don't want to do and be, but power to help us become who we were created to be. You know, all through my life, I've had my ups and downs. I was called into ministry as a teenager, but then I turned my back on God. I abandoned my call. Uh, I, I went through some dark times, one time so dark that I didn't care if people lived or died. I didn't care if I hurt people or not. It was a dark time. I turned my back on God. But here's the thing. God never turned his back on me. And today I'm a changed person. I'm a new creation. Today I'm not all that God has called me to be, but I am working to become the man that God has called me to be. And I challenge you to do the same thing. God is giving us a second chance. That's what the resurrection is about. That death is no longer the worst thing that can happen to us because there is something better beyond. That there is life after death. And that this life that we're living now, it doesn't matter what you've done. God will forgive you and give you that second chance. I'm not asking you to give a denomination a try. Who knows what the Methodist will be 10 years from now. I'm not asking you to give Christians a try because we're weird. I mean, there's some of us that are just weird. We have funny hair. I don't have enough hair to have funny hair. Christians are just weird people sometimes. I'm not asking you to give Christians a try. I'm asking you, I'm challenging you to give Jesus a try. Because he's giving you that chance, that second chance, that third chance. Give Jesus a chance. That's what, that's what today's about. That's what Easter is about. The celebration of the resurrection is the recognition of a second chance. That Jesus said, oh, no, death, you don't have power anymore. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with the saints to reign. He arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Jesus said, here, I'll take all your mistakes to the grave with me so you don't have to deal with them. I'll give you that second chance. I'll pay the debt because I am more powerful than death. Let, let me deal with your sin so you can have the abundant life I created you for. He arose. The empty tomb is your second chance because even death is not the end. Jesus is stronger than the worst thing you can imagine. That's the message of the cross. That's the message of the tomb. Hallelujah, Christ arose. Won't you give him a chance? Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for this day, for this celebration of Easter, of the resurrection, of, of the life that we have because of the death, burial, and resurrection of your Son. God, because of that, you have accepted us. We can, we can receive the forgiveness. We can receive the free gift that is offered in Christ. So God, may each one of us this day, seek you. May we all give Jesus a chance because he's given us a second chance. Amen.